All right, I'll be preaching from Psalm 93. So if you could turn to, turn to Psalm 93. Now, I've, I've been given permission to stretch this out a little bit this morning because Sam's uh, not going to be with us. So I've got a little bit more leeway to use, which is great. But yeah, if we turn to Psalm 93. Now, when I put this sermon together, I just allowed the psalm itself to determine what I was going to preach on. So I had no particular agenda when I read this, this psalm. I just want to make that clear right now because the title of this little sermonette, I'll call it uh, Jesus Christ, the Everlasting Son of God. And if we go to Psalm 93, now what I'm going to do, we'll, start, we'll actually skip down to verse 5. I'm going to start with verse 5. And it reads, Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. So notice there the plurality, wow, tongue-tied, but it's not just one testimony, it's multiple, it says testimonies. Now you could argue that it could be testimonies on a lot of different subjects or topics or you know, different elements of God's law, for example, in the context here. Or it could be the testimony of multiple witnesses, right, in verse 5 here. Now what I want to do, if we go to John chapter 8, John chapter 8, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. So I'll just stop, park it there for a second. So the context here is obviously the judgment of this woman caught in adultery. She's been caught in the very act, and these men have witnessed it, and they're there to condemn her. And they're trying to catch Jesus out. They're trying to put him in a, in a hard place here because they also want him to condemn her. Right? But Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to seek and save that which was lost. That was his mission when he came. Now, is he going to judge the world? Yeah, he will. But in this instance, Jesus, you know, he gets out of this by basically getting rid of these witnesses, by basically saying, posing, hey, look, those without sin cast the first stone. And so they all left. And basically in the Old Testament law, for judgment to be carried out, say in this case for somebody that committed adultery, there had to be two or more witnesses. There had to be the testimony of more than one witness. And when we read in Psalms about the testimony of the Lord being sure, when we read further down here, And that's actually taken from Deuteronomy 19.15. I'll just read that really quickly from the Old Testament law before I continue that passage. 19.15, it reads, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. 
So the Pharisees are aware of the law. They've already mentioned Moses. You know, they know this law. They know. And they also know that, you know, she's been caught in adultery, so she should be stoned. Now, if we continue on in verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. This goes back to Deuteronomy 9 and 15. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. So we can see multiple testimonies. Here there's the testimony of the Father and the testimony of the Son. So when it comes to judgment, when it comes to, say, our judgment, so not just, say, this woman caught in adultery, but just anybody that's judged of God, there's more than one witness. Otherwise, God becomes a hypocrite. So because the Lord Jesus Christ can see all of our sins and the Father can see all of our sins, when it comes to judgment, they're both going to testify or have a testimony of those that have broken those commandments. And that testimony is true. And so let's go back to Psalm 93. So I believe the testimonies there in Psalm 93 are the testimonies of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we'll go to verse 1. The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with, clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. So here it talks about the majesty of God. It's describe, describing his majesty, which if you go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, which the Lord Jesus also shares. So 2 Peter 1.16. This is Peter, the apostle, speaking, and he's recalling an event that he witnessed, which was Jesus' transfiguration. And it reads, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice from him, from him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here you have the Father, and you have the Son, you have the Father speaking to the Son, in whom he is well pleased, and the Son has this majesty, which he shares with the Father. They both have majesty. And Psalm 93 is describing this majesty of the Lord, and also the world, that it cannot be moved. And if we go to verse 2, it says, Thy throne is established of old, thou art from everlasting. Now the same can be said of God the Father, but also God the Son of God. He's from everlasting. Because if we go to Micah 5, quickly Micah 5, in verse 2, this is a prophecy about the coming of the Lord. In Micah 5, 2, it reads, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So we know Jesus is from everlasting. The psalm here is describing a throne that's established of old and he is, that thou art from everlasting. So this is the Father and the Son. And you could argue, well, hold on a second, it says throne. Isn't the throne the Father's? Or well, Hebrews 1.8. And, but unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God. So it's not just the Father's throne, it's also the Son's throne. And we know Jesus will sit at the right hand of God at the throne throne, but it basically it indicates here that the throne is the Lord Jesus and it's also the Father's. But they're clearly different people because otherwise their testimony is not true. If it was just the Father taking on the persona of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the testimony would be false. They are individuals that make up the one God. And this is what we see in this Psalm 93 by cross-referencing these different verses of the Bible, that this is describing the Father as well as the Son. 
And then in verse 3, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. And here it's just, the psalmist is embellishing on more about the power of God, that even the waves do not compare to the Lord. You know, they don't compare to his majesty. He reigns from above. He's created all things. But I guess what I want us to take away from this this psalm, and, and just throughout the whole Old Testament, I guess, it's not just this psalm, but when we're reading through these psalms and Old Testament scriptures, Jesus Christ will jump out of the pages at you when you, when you look for it, when you see it. And, and it's simply just by cross-referencing certain verses with other passages in the New Testament, because the New Testament really sheds a lot of light on these when we look for those cross-references. So that, that verse on the throne, it's, it's the Son's throne as well as the Father's throne. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So Jesus is the everlasting Son of God. He's not the Father, he's the Son of God. And there's those three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.